June 2006, Phoenix, Arizona. A towering wall of dust engulfs the city. It is 3,000 feet high and 50 miles wide. The dust storm, known as a haboob, blocks out the sun. In a matter of minutes, visibility is at zero. Traffic grinds to a halt. This same phenomenon entangled one of the most daring rescue missions in American history, Operation Eagle Claw. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, a secret military operation to rescue Americans held hostage in Iran. I get pretty upset when somebody takes, uh, you know, American hostages. Soldiers fly into enemy territory across hundreds of miles of desert, but encounter an unforeseen enemy. I had never heard of a haboob. I'm not sure if our weather guy even heard of it. It was about as scary as you'd ever want to be in a foreign country doing something covert. That's a kamikaze mission, because you don't know what's out there in front of you. The lives of these elite soldiers and dozens of American hostages hang in the balance. In my mind, a hero is somebody who intentionally goes in harm's way, and those were the heroes. <laughs> November 4th, 1979, Tehran, Iran. Protesters storm the U.S. Embassy. They take 66 Americans hostage, including Marine Guard Rocky Sickman. You felt like uh, an animal in a zoo walking around. People were taking pictures. They were bringing guns up to your head. The Islamic radicals, followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini, demand that the United States hand over their deposed Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who is in the U.S. for cancer treatment. Only then will they free the hostages. President Jimmy Carter refuses to make the trade. He also rules out a military strike against Iran. The president wanted to solve this with diplomacy and not with the use of force. He wanted to get every hostage out alive. Within three weeks, the Iranians released 13 hostages. 53 remain captive. Secretly, military leaders begin planning for a possible mission to rescue them. They know that autumn would be a perfect time for the U.S. to take action. Nighttime temperatures average 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Dust storm season is still months away. The sands of the Dashti Kavir Desert are calm. In Tehran, the sun sets around 5 p.m. and rises around 6.30 a.m. Troops would have time to maneuver under the cover of darkness and rescue the hostages. But President Carter still hopes to negotiate a peaceful resolution to the crisis. Our response will measure our character and our courage. Inside the 27-acre embassy compound, the hostages are bound and blindfolded. They are not allowed to speak. You set a schedule for yourself. If I can get through the next hour, I can get through the next day. And if I can get through the next day, I can get through the next week, and so forth. The hostages endure isolation and ruthless interrogations. At times, they are rounded up and hauled from their cells. A bunch of gunmen came in with ski masks on and grabbed us up, put us up against the wall and then walked up around behind us and, and uh, you could hear them lock and load their weapon. It's like, get up, hands up. Again, your past is flying in front of you and you're thinking, you know, this is definitely it. And then they whisper in your ear and pull the trigger. In the US, frustration with the hostage crisis escalates. The country felt helpless. We were weak in front of a determined Iranian antagonist, and no one seemed to be making any kind of assertion of American strength. The Carter administration continues to pursue diplomatic efforts to free the hostages, but also moves forward with planning for a rescue mission. Military leaders know that weather 
will play a pivotal role in the success or failure of such an operation. But the desert climate of the Middle East is unfamiliar to U.S. armed forces. A newly formed military team known as Delta Force, based in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, is told to prepare for a mission. This elite counterterrorism unit is made up of the best servicemen in the Army. Among the volunteers was former Green Beret and Army Ranger, Logan Fitch. I pursued Delta Force like uh, she was uh, Miss America. This was, uh, you know, the, the elite of the elite, and I wanted to see if I was good enough to be in it. They were men who loved to be soldiers. These were hot shots. They were the best, and they knew they were. Fitch is chosen to serve on the Delta Force under the command of Colonel Charlie Beckwith. Battle-tested in Korea and Vietnam, Beckwith has the nickname Charging Charlie. In the early 60s, he was shot with a 50 caliber machine gun, and he took a round in the stomach and lived through it, which is amazing. One of the architects of the rescue plan is Air Force Colonel Jim Kyle. Kyle will train the pilots who will be handpicked from the Navy, Air Force, and Marines. If the mission is approved, these men would fly the Delta Force into Iran. Later, they'll return the troops and the freed hostages to safety. Kyle goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Beckwith in strategy meetings. Charlie's a guy you got to prove yourself to. But once he saw what we could do for him, uh, he and I became respectful warriors for the mission. Both Kyle and Beckwith understand they are planning one of the most challenging rescue missions in U.S. military history. One problem is that intelligence about the hostages is limited. The soldiers don't know exactly where the hostages are being kept within the sprawling embassy compound or how many men are guarding them. Colonel Beckwith determines that he will need 120 Delta Force commandos to carry out the mission. The operation would also have to take place under the cover of darkness to avoid being spotted by enemy lookouts. Team leaders know that Iran has limited radar capabilities, but operates a variety of listening devices. To avoid detection, the pilots will have to maintain radio silence. Any communication we were supposed to do, we could have done with the, the little infrared lights that we had or with hand signals. Moonlight and clear skies will be vital for the pilots to navigate in the darkness. A team of forecasters is assembled to determine the best weather conditions. It is imperative that the mission take place when the weather in Iran is cool. The punishing desert heat not only causes troop fatigue, but also decreases the carrying capacity of the aircraft. In the heat, the air is less dense and the engines are run less efficient. So we needed a reasonably cool evening to give them the operating parameters to safely operate at the weights they were at. Mission planners determined that the months of November through April offer the best window of opportunity. The nights will be long enough to provide cover of darkness, and it will be cool enough. If they miss this deadline, the team will be unable to attempt a rescue until the fall of 1980. That's because after April, Warmer temperatures increase the chance for a dangerous weather event, a desert dust storm. The Middle East is really the, the classic location for these dust storms. So what you need is you need high winds, and you need hot air, and you need a lot of dust. And the Middle East is the dustiest part of the world. One of the most frequent types of dust storms is a haboob, which means wind phenomenon in Arabic. A haboob is created in the aftermath of a thunderstorm. The air surrounding the dying storm is cooler than its environment. That air races downward, creating what are known as downdrafts. After that downdraft comes into contact with a desert surface, hot, dry, soils, hot air, and that downdraft then starts turbulent motion, and the dust gets lifted up. It's very intense, and you will have literally a wall of dust in front of you. December 4th, 1979, day 31 of the hostage crisis. 
the mission pilots and members of Delta Force transfer to a base near Yuma, Arizona, where the desert conditions are similar to those in Iran. There's mountains out there, and there's, there's similar terrains in that part of the country, so it was an infinitely better place to train. Here, pilots rehearse maneuvers for the mission. At night, team members watch news reports from Tehran. They consider the risks of encountering the enemy, but another adversary will rise up against them, one they never imagined. Coming up, Delta Force readies itself for its daring mission. It was personal. Uh, personal in the sense that uh, all of us recognized how important it was to the United States. We, we knew exactly where we stood and what, what was at stake. January 1980. The hostage crisis in Iran is now entering its third month. 8,000 miles away in the arid desert near Yuma, Arizona, an elite group of soldiers and pilots train for Operation Eagle Claw to rescue the hostages. The location has been picked to simulate Iran's arid conditions, but the team trains in mild temperatures when dust storms are less likely to occur. There's not a whole lot of bad weather in Yuma, and we never really focus too much that I recall on bad weather. The training in Yuma fails to provide the one experience the soldiers will need most. They never witness the blinding conditions that occur when wind and dust descend. Winds within a hubu can be in excess of 60 and 70 miles an hour, and so you have that dust traveling at the same speed as the wind. Haboobs can be powerful enough to strip the paint off cars. Air temperature can climb to more than 100 degrees inside the dust cloud. U.S. Army weather experts monitor the desert conditions in Iran, but limited data and technology do not provide details about haboobs. CIA operatives have experienced them, but as is often the case, their information is not shared with the military. March 31st. A CIA Twin Otter aircraft makes a secret flight over Iran's Dashti Kavir Desert. Air Force Commander John Carney is on board. His undercover mission to find and set up a remote staging area for the troops. We needed a landing site, somewhere where we could reconstitute the force, refuel the helicopters, and get up to the city. 265 miles southeast of Tehran, Carney spots the perfect location. It's a, a plateau that just almost like 18,000 miles wide. <laughs> I mean, it's just huge, flat terrain. And uh, there's roads that have been there for the Middle Ages, I'm sure. He places five remote-controlled radio-activated beacons in the sand. The landing zone is basically a box in one, where you land in the box, and you roll out, and at the end of it is, a, uh, is another light and you don't go past that light. If you go past that light, it could be the Grand Canyon, for all I know. It is here that the helicopters and the rescue mission will refuel on their way to Tehran. At the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, the 53 American hostages bear their captivity by reading, sleeping, and exercising. Your mind played so many different games with you. You didn't feel like living. You were upset at yourself. You are upset at your government. Some hostages, like political officer John Limbert, befriend the guards. Maybe, just maybe, if it came down to a rescue mission, that person who knew you a little bit better and knew a little bit more about you might hesitate for 30 seconds, 15 seconds before shooting you. Limbert and the other hostages have no idea that a barren landscape near Yuma, Arizona has become the training ground for a mission to free them. As the crisis continues, pilots and Delta Force commandos steel themselves for what lies ahead. I honestly believe that we could do it. It was a horribly complicated operation with lots of moving parts, but I thought we could pull it off. By April 1980, the plan is set. All military leaders need now is the go-ahead from the president. 
I didn't think we would go because I didn't think that Carter had the to approve it. If the order comes down, the covert mission will take place over two nights. The first night, six C-130 transport planes carrying 120 Delta Force commandos would depart from the island of Masira off the coast of Oman, flying just behind the C-130s and launched from the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz, stationed in the Arabian Sea, would be eight Sea Stallion helicopters. All the aircraft would rendezvous at the staging area located by John Carney, codenamed Desert One. It is a wide, flat area with a road running through it, an ideal spot for landing and takeoff. We didn't want the C-130s to get bogged down in the sand. And when we looked at the satellite imagery, we could see that was a pretty solid area, just like a parking lot out there. For the mission to succeed, at least six of the eight helicopters must make it to Desert One. If fewer than six choppers reach the rendezvous point, they will be unable to transport all 120 men in the Delta Force squadron, and the mission will be aborted. At Desert One, Jet fuel containers aboard the C-130s will refuel the helicopters. The rescue team will then board the choppers and fly to the hills outside of Tehran. On the second night, Delta Force commandos will assault the embassy compound and secure the hostages. At the same time, a company of U.S. Rangers will seize a nearby airstrip. There, the transport planes will be waiting to fly the hostages to freedom. After months of training, the mission team feels well rehearsed and confident. We were getting pretty damn good. We knew we were going to succeed, but there's always an unknown unknowns. Still to come on When Weather Changed History, a raging 6,000-foot wall of dust will push the soldiers to their limits. No one ever forecasted it. We hadn't planned on it. Had we known there was something around there, we probably wouldn't have flown the mission that night. April 11th, 1980, day 160 of the hostage crisis. An elite group of soldiers and pilots has been training for months on a top secret mission to free American hostages in Iran. With the nights becoming shorter and temperatures rising, the mission's window of opportunity is quickly beginning to close. After several failed negotiations to free the hostages, the president tells his advisors that he is now prepared to use force. We all realized this was a, a momentous decision for the president. So it was a dramatic moment when he said, let's get on with the operation. We've waited long enough. I was quite excited about it personally. I mean, you know, I get pretty upset when somebody takes, uh, you know, American hostages. We were exhilarated. We were just, just waiting, couldn't wait to go. I just uh, thought to myself, well, we're finally going to do something. April 24th. The mission team moves into position. On the island of Masira, Air Force Colonel Jim Kyle and the 120-man Delta Force team are ready to launch. Some of the Delta Force commandos have grown out their hair and beards to better blend in among the Iranians. We took great pride in the fact that we we're going to, one of the most important missions our nation has undertaken, we we're going to go get our hostages back and kick these guys in the while we were at it. Three C-130 planes loaded with 120 members of Delta Force and three more planes carrying 18,000 gallons of jet fuel are set to leave at dusk. Pilots await a final weather briefing before takeoff. Military meteorologists rely mainly on satellite images because there are few weather observation posts within Iran. Delivery of these images is slow. Back then, they were getting two images a day, so every 12 hours. It's tough to pick up on an event where a haboob is going to form. Certain desert phenomena, like haboobs, can rise thousands of feet into the air and then disappear before a satellite can record their presence. 4.30 p.m. Mission planners receive the latest weather forecast. 
Meteorologists predict isolated thunderstorms along the Iran-Iraq border, but no sandstorms. They expect clear skies over the rest of the country. Conditions look perfect. They looked at the weather and said it probably would never be any better than this. 6.05 p.m. The first C-130 takes off for Desert One. 250 miles north aboard the USS Nimitz aircraft carrier in the Arabian Sea, the eight Sea Stallion helicopters are brought on deck. 7.05 p.m. The choppers lift off for Desert One. Below pilot Jim Schaefer's helicopter, thousands of sailors salute the mission team. As we launched off, but you looked, you saw people manning the rails all over the place. It brought tears to your eyes. But members of Operation Eagle Claw are on a collision course with a powerful force of nature, a monstrous haboob. When we return, zero visibility, driving dust, and soaring temperatures threaten to bring down the mission. Well, that's a kamikaze mission because you don't know what's out there in front of you. April 24th, 1980. Day 173 of the hostage crisis. Hundreds of miles south of Tehran, the dust begins to stir as an ordinary spring thunderstorm passes through the area. It is 7.40 p.m. as the eight U.S. Sea Stallion helicopters cross Iran's southern border. The weather is crystal clear. We flew over the first coastline, and it was just like we planned it. I mean, there's the map, there's the line, and the checkpoints are coming by, and they're going this and that, and everything was just perfect. There you are, sitting there, moon, nice moonlit night, probably some of the best stuff you'd ever flown in in the past five months. The conditions were ideal. But 125 miles ahead, the lead C-130 transport plane flies into a cloudy haze. Visibility is drastically cut. Air Force Commander Jim Kyle is summoned to the cockpit, where the temperature rises to roughly 100 degrees. The guys were unzipping the top of their flight suit and bringing it down around their hips, and, and we were all perspiring, even though we had the air conditioners on full blast. One of the men on that lead plane is Air Force Colonel John Carney. He's familiar with Middle East weather and informs Colonel Kyle that they're flying through a suspended dust storm called a haboob. And I looked out, I said, that's a haboob, and they kind of laughed at me. I had never heard of a haboob. I know the helicopter guys hadn't either. Uh, I'm not sure if our weather guy even heard of it. Kyle knows maneuvering through the dust storm will be much harder for the helicopter pilots coming up behind them. He also knows that if he sends a warning to the chopper pilots, enemy forces could intercept the message. But Kyle believes the danger posed by the dust storm is too great. He orders the crew to break radio silence. I said, send a message that we've encountered some restriction to visibility out here, but we're pressing on through it, and they should too. 150 miles behind the C-130s, the choppers encounter their first setback. Shortly after entering Iran, one of them suffers a rotor blade malfunction and must land. The formation is now down to seven helicopters. Six must make it to Desert One for the mission to continue. 9.30 p.m., the C-130 formation nears Desert One. As Colonel Kyle's plane begins its descent, he receives some startling news. The helicopter pilots were never warned about the dust storm. The radio operator didn't have a code word for dust storm and didn't send the message. If an uncoded transmission had been intercepted, the message would have revealed that U.S. planes had entered Iranian airspace and would have exposed their position inside the haboob. My heart dropped clear to my boots. I knew that they were going to be screwed up when they hit that weather. I didn't realize how bad they would be screwed up. Fifteen minutes later, the seven helicopters approached the ominous haboob. I can 
remember asking, what is that up there? Are we, looks like we're flying into a mountain or something. And it's just like a big wall of fog that was kind of flowing up. It's kind of like flying in a milk bottle. It was just real hazy. So, hmm. That doesn't seem to be on our menu. <laughs> I licked my finger and stuck it out in my little air hole here on the side and brought it back in and tasted it. it was dusty. So there's a lot of dust in the air. This was new to me. I haven't seen anything like this. The mammoth haboob extends over 6,000 feet into the air and smothers 100 miles of desert. Visibility drops to zero. The pilots try flying at high and then low altitudes to escape the dust, but there are no openings. They are trapped. The crew members in the back of the helicopter lost visual contact with the helicopters behind us. The chopper formation breaks apart. At 10 p.m., Colonel Kyle's C-130 nears Desert One, followed by the others. The crew makes three passes over the remote landing strip to make sure all is clear. Team member John Carney activates the remote landing lights that he had set up a month earlier. When John Carney uh, turned on his uh, remote runway lights, they lit up perfectly. We could see the little box pattern down there where we're supposed to touch down. The C-130s land without incident. The men are excited and ready for phase two. But just after touching down, they get a surprise. A bus full of Iranians cuts across the usually deserted road. It was a modern Mercedes bus. It was well lit, and you could see the people in it. It was just bizarre, just bizarre. A team of soldiers commandeers the bus and detains its Iranian passengers. The plan was to just take the bus out of the, out of the area somewhere and uh, disable it and uh, made for one unhappy Iranian bus driver. And you imagine, you know, <laughs> you're driving down the road in a bus and there's an airplane uh, landing there beside you and so they were terrorized. Moments later, another surprise, an Iranian gasoline truck speeds through Desert One. The troops give chase. One of the rangers had a light anti-tank weapon, a law and he fired it at the vehicle and it went under the cab and ricocheted up into the back and it blew up. And then that was one huge ball of flame. And so over this uh, supposedly clandestine operation, we now have 43, I think it was 43 Iranians captured, uh, a nice modern Mercedes bus. And right on the parallel runway that we're gonna land on, we have this giant fire going out there. I always remark later on, I don't know why I went and put lights, we could have just done that technique, just blew up a truck and we could have lit up the whole place. I could read a dime novel a mile away. Roughly 200 miles south, the seven remaining helicopter pilots struggle through blackout conditions. Night vision goggles are useless in the blinding sandstorm. Even the most seasoned mission pilots are unnerved. You have just got to fight off what your body is telling you, what your mind is telling you. You can't differentiate between what the ground is and what the horizon is or anything else. It's like, what the devil is going on here? The helicopters slow to 100 miles per hour as dust permeates the aircraft. Temperatures inside the helicopters are now approaching 100 degrees. The men are becoming fatigued. We drank a lot of water. It was hot. It was dry, and it was pretty miserable. The scorching air is less dense, and cockpit controls become less responsive. The engines strain from the heat and sand. Worse yet, the pilots are navigating through Iran's treacherous Zagros Mountains. They do their best to follow their flight map, but Schaefer and his co-pilot are flying blind. And so from that point there, we were supposed to turn to a new heading, and uh, I said, OK, that's what's in front of us. And he said, oh, a 9,000-foot mountain. So, Around 11 p.m., one of the choppers experiences instrument failure. The co-pilot loses his bearings in the dust storm as vertigo sets in. Vertigo is a disorientation. You think you're turning right or turning left or climbing or going down when you're doing something different. The pilot knows that two mountain peaks are somewhere in the distance, completely obscured by the storm. 
the battered crew is faced with a gut-wrenching decision. They have committed themselves to freeing the hostages, but they know that continuing would be suicide. The chopper turns back. There are now only six helicopters en route to Desert One, the bare minimum needed to carry out the rescue mission. The remaining pilots carry on unaware of how many helicopters are still on course. We lost visual contact with everybody. So it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, great concern, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. It's 12.50 a.m. The helicopters are 50 minutes behind schedule. Colonel Kyle and the others who have already landed at Desert One are growing anxious. We're chomping at the bit, chewing our nails, because we're running out of time for darkness to get the force up north and get them inserted, and the helicopter is in hiding. Next, on When Weather Changed History, swirling sand has deadly consequences. There was fire all around me, and I'm trying to figure out what the hell happened. Friday, April 25th, 1980, 1.15 a.m. Six of eight sea stallion helicopters, part of a mission to rescue hostages in Iran, are trapped by a blinding sandstorm. It was about as scary as you'd ever want to be in a foreign country doing something covert and not being able to see the other helicopters in the formation, not being able to see the mountains that were around. By this time, the C-130 crews are already on the ground. But the choppers are now more than an hour behind schedule, a delay that could cost them the mission. Delta Force Squadron Commander Logan Fitch is concerned. We became very, very uneasy sitting out there and all primed and ready to go. Uh, no helicopters. Finally, after navigating through the blinding dust for over an hour and a half, two helicopters break into clear skies. Over the next half hour, the remaining choppers slowly make their way to Desert One. Worry turns to elation as pilot Ed Seaford's helicopter finally touches down. You start counting the aircraft that are down on the, on the desert floor and say, hey, we still got six aircraft. We're ready to go. We're good to go. But there are new problems to contend with. Pilots notice that the ground at Desert One isn't the paved surface that was promised. Military planners failed to predict that weather conditions would cover the highway in several inches of loose sediment. This will make takeoff more difficult. It was a pumicey type sand, gritty type sand. It wasn't exactly as uh, what the original intelligence had, had told us. 2.30 a.m., Delta Force leader Charlie Beckwith is alerted to a problem with one of the Sea Stallion helicopters. Next thing I know, Beckwith comes up and he says, uh, number two is shut down. Uh, you speak their language, go down and see what the hell's going on. Colonel Kyle finds out that the helicopter has a broken hydraulic pump. The chopper is deemed unsafe to fly. Now they're down to just five helicopters, not enough to transport all 120 Delta Force commandos. Kyle and Delta Force leader Charlie Beckwith's hands are tied. It became a choice of reducing the fuel load on the remaining helicopters and putting more of Delta on or cutting 20 Delta shooters out. Neither of those options were good options. Beckwith says, I don't know what I'm up against in Tehran. I need every man I got. They know they are making an historic decision. I got right in his face. Uh, I'm talking about a decision that we're going to I'm sure I end up in front of the Congress testifying on, about we're not going to go on. We're going to we're going to abort, and that's 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 the name of the game, right? And he says I I'm not going to cut my force. Word travels all the way up the chain of command to Washington. President Carter concurs with Beckwith. The rescue operation cannot be completed without six helicopters. The mission is scrapped. The soldiers follow orders and prepare to evacuate Desert One. Their spirits are crushed. After months of intense training and preparation, the soldiers won't have the chance to free the American hostages. There wasn't anything we could do. I mean, yeah, yeah, 
we had reached the point that, that all the planning, everything had just gone right straight out the window. And I went from complete joy to, uh, it was almost like scoring a touchdown and the official called it back for offsides. 2.55 a.m. After refueling, the helicopter crews will be the first to evacuate. Churning aircraft engines are blowing massive amounts of sand into the air. Helicopter pilot Jim Schaefer lifts off and hovers about 25 feet in the air. The loose particles on the road swirl around the chopper. Schaefer cannot see that he is dangerously close to one of the C-130 transport planes on the ground. Inside the C-130, Commander Logan Fitch and his troops are preparing for takeoff when they feel the aircraft shudder. I heard two or three thunks, uh, and they, were, they reverberated pretty strongly through the aircraft. In the helicopter cockpit, pilot Jim Schaefer is jolted in his seat. It just sounded like somebody took a strong aluminum bat and hit the side of the aircraft. Schaefer's helicopter is veered off course. It smashes into the cockpit of the C-130. Sparks ignite the fuel and ammunition in both aircraft, causing a horrific explosion. You know, I thought we were under attack. And you could see that wall of flame advancing from the front of the aircraft back toward us. A couple of us ran to the cockpit and were pounding on the side of the cockpit for the guys to come out the windows. There was fire all around me, and I was trying to figure out what the hell happened. And I remember diving through the fire onto the ground. Jim Schaefer and his co-pilot are badly burned, but escape alive. But the fire is now spreading through the cabin of the C-130. Now we really got problems. Now we have ammunition that's cooking off from the fire, uh, zinging through the, along the desert floor. Logan Fitch and his troops are trapped in the plane. They open the side hatch to try to escape. The whole thing was just a sheet of flames. The only, uh, the only exit, the right rear troop door. Fitch and his troops make a run for it. Within seconds, the C-130 becomes a raging ball of fire. And it exploded, and you could just see the fuselage buckle. And that explosion, I don't know what blew, but something did, and a body came flying out. But you know, you look up there and you could see nothing. Uh, I think they got incinerated very, very rapidly. It was just a, a scene that uh, I don't ever want to witness again. Eight soldiers perish in the inferno. Three men inside the Sea Stallion chopper and five from the C-130 transport plane. The Desert One location has already been compromised and daylight is fast approaching. Mission leaders know that waiting to extract the bodies is too risky. One of the ranger credos is leave no man behind. And it hurts. It hurt then, it hurts now to know that we left people laying on the desert floor dead. I think if you told them we'd stay there and fight, we probably would have. But it was, uh, you know, you just lose a lot of lives. And there's nothing we could do for them. Up next. Washington comes to terms with the rescue mission that was foiled by a sandstorm. Carter's chief of staff heard the news about what happened. I had to duck out of the office and go to the bathroom off the Oval Office and vomit. And the world wakes up to the horrific images at Desert One. There was no fighting. There was no combat. But to my deep regret, eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. April 25th, 1980. Americans wake up to the horrific images of Desert One. Eight soldiers are dead. To the families of those who died and who were wounded, I want to express the admiration I feel for the courage of their loved ones. In Tehran, after the hostage takers learn about the secret mission, they take immediate action. The hostages are told nothing about the failed rescue attempt as they are dispersed to sites across the country. The distances that now separate them will make any further rescue attempts impossible. The hostages continue their captivity for the remaining 270 days of President Carter's term in office. In November 1980, Ronald Reagan defeats Jimmy Carter in a landslide victory. 
the hostage crisis pushed Americans to the right. They didn't want ever again to experience that kind of humiliation. During the last days of his term, Carter's diplomatic efforts finally succeed. The Iranians agree to free the hostages, but they delay the release as long as they can. The Iranians waited until the day that Ronald Reagan was sworn in in order to deny Carter the satisfaction of having brought this crisis to a successful resolution. After 444 days in captivity, the hostages board a plane to freedom. The homecoming is bittersweet. The newly freed hostages learn that eight soldiers died while trying to liberate them. That's something that you don't ever forget. Someone given the almighty uh, sacrifice their life to come save you. People called us heroes when we came back, and that's not true. In my mind, a hero is somebody who intentionally goes in harm's way, and those were the heroes. <laughs> In the decades since a giant dust storm known as a Haboob ensnared Operation Eagle Claw, the U.S. military has made sweeping improvements in weather technology. It really was the first time that uh, desert forecasting became an issue. Of course, it found weaknesses in the way we do business, and so it, we strengthened those parts. It also gave us a focal point to try to improve. Operation Eagle Claw also had a profound impact overseas. To this day, many devout Muslims in Iran see dust storms as legendary events. Haboobs in the desert were a sure sign of Allah's intervention in history. And it's believed by the religious folks in Iran that their God protected them from this American invasion that makes for a mighty powerful myth in a religious country. While several factors contributed to the collapse of this mission, the men who were there agree that one factor outweighed the rest, the weather. There is no doubt had that suspended dust storm not been there, this mission would have been complete and only history would be the judge of whether it was success or not. 